Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve maximum depth of a binary tree. And the main reason I'm solving this today is just for the sake of completion. We have solved harder tree problems before, but this one is on the blind 75 list. So I do want to solve this problem today. And this problem actually has multiple ways to solve it. So I do think it's a good problem to understand of like the fundamentals on uh, tree traversals we can do it three different ways and I'm actually going to show the three different ways there might even be more than three but I'm going to show you the three main ways basically recursive depth for search iterative depth for search basically depth for search without using recursion and of course another way is going to be breadth for search so I'm going to be showing all three today so the problem is pretty simple. We're given a root binary tree and we want to return its maximum depth. And the maximum depth is defined as being the longest path from the root to one of the no to, to one of the leaf nodes. And basically along that path, we're counting the number of nodes. So in this case, you can see we have two paths that are of the same length. So from the root down to here, we have three nodes. From the root down to here, we have three nodes as well. So those are the two leaf nodes we have here. We also have a leaf node on the left side, but clearly we see that there's only two nodes in this path. So out of all those paths, what's the max length? Of course, it's three. So you can see that that's what our output is going to be in this problem. So the simplest way to solve this problem is recursive depth first search. Now, what's the base case? We're using recursion. So first, let's think of the base case. Obviously, if we had just an empty tree, right? Like what's what if this was our tree? What are we going to return? Of course, zero, right? The max depth of an empty tree is just zero. What about if we just had one node and no children, right? Okay, we do this recursively. So we'd get to the first node, right? We'd say, okay, we at least have one node. Then we'd say, okay, let's just find the max of the left subtree and the max of the, the right subtree. Both of those are going to return zero, right? So once we get back to the root, what are we going to say? We're going to say, okay, the left and right subtree were zero. So the maximum of the left and right subtree is also zero. So what we're going to return from the perspective of this root node is just going to be one plus the max one plus the max of the left and right results. Basically the the max of the left and right subtrees, in which case it was both zero. So of course, in this problem, we're going to return one as the max depth. Now let's look at this more general example that they gave us. So obviously we're going to do the same thing. We're going to get to the root, say, okay, we found at least one uh, node. So the depth is at least one. And then we're going to return the max of, we're going to return the max of the left and right subtrees plus one. And why are we doing it this way? Well, you can see that we found this node, but now we have sub problems, right? We need to know what's the max path, what's the max depth, and we'll have to search the left subtree and we'll have to search the right subtree. So we're not even considering this node anymore. We're doing recursion. We're looking at the sub problem. What's the max depth of this left subtree? Well, of course, it's just a node a single node with no children. So of course the max depth is gonna be one. Similarly, let's do the right subtree. And so again, this is gonna be our recursive case, right? We have one node and from the, the, this node's perspective, we're gonna run recursion again. We're gonna look at the left subtree and the right subtree, both of which are gonna return one. So then of course, from this node's perspective, we're gonna return two. The max depth of this subtree is two. The max depth of the left subtree is one. So now when we get back up here, we're saying, okay, from the perspective of this node, we're going to return one plus the max of left and right. The max is clearly two. So from this node's perspective, we're going to return three. The max depth is three. So let's code this up recursively. It's literally just going to be this line that I just wrote and the base case. And since we are traversing the entire tree, the time complexity is going to be big O of n. The memory complexity is just going to be the height of the tree, which also could be worst case big O of n if it's a not, if it's not a balanced binary tree. So with recursion, we always want to take care of the base case first. So if the root is null, then of course, we're just going to return zero. That's the max depth. Otherwise, we're going to return one plus the max of what our DFS of left returns, or in this case, it's not DFS. It's actually called max depth. And since we're inside of the function in Python, you have to you know say self dot max depth and then run that on the left subtree and also run it on the right subtree. Now to make this line shorter, I could actually store the result of both of these function calls in variables, but I think this one liner is pretty much good enough. So we're just taking the result of both of these function calls, figuring out what's the max of it. So what's the max subtrees depth? 
of both of the subtrees and then just adding one to it because we know that the current node, the current root node that we're traversing is definitely not null. So this calculation will work out. Let's submit it. And of course, I'm showing that I can't even solve easy problems. So it's not called node. It's actually called root. Hopefully you were able to catch that. But yeah, so this is the entire problem. But what if you're an interviewer or what if you just want to do this for learning purposes? You want to solve this problem without recursion. Well, there's two ways to do it. Iterative depth first search or iterative breadth first search. And I'm going to show you both of those right now. Now, there's not a lot of benefits to using breadth first search on this problem compared to just doing DFS recursively, mainly that you just don't have to do recursion at all. The time complexity is still going to be the same. The memory complexity is still going to be the same. But let's still do this for learning purposes. So breadth for search on a tree is basically level order traversal. We're traversing each level by level until we get to the end or the last level and then we can't continue anymore. So you can kind of see how breadth for search is a pretty intuitive way to find the max depth, right? We're basically counting the number of levels we have. So here we see, okay, we have one level. Next we see we have two levels. Oh, this is the third level and we can't go any lower. So what's the number of levels that we had? We had three. That's the number of levels is basically going to be the same as the max depth. So now the only problem is how are we actually going to code this up. Now typically BFS involves a queue or a deck, a DQ or however you call it. And so the way it's going to work is the queue is initially just going to have the root value. So I'm going to kind of represent this array as the queue. So initially we're just going to put the root in the queue, right? So now we're going to say, okay, what's the length of our queue? This is, these are the elements currently in our queue and th these are all at level one. So now we're going to go through every node in our queue. We only have one and we're going to take three. Now we're going to remove it from our queue and we're going to replace it with its children, nine and 20. So let's add nine and 20 to the queue. So now this is our second level, right? These elements that we have here are our second level of the queue, the second level of the tree. So we're going to do the exact same thing with these two nodes. We're going to take the first one, nine, get rid of it. We see nine is here. Now we're going to replace it with its children. It doesn't have any children, so we don't have to replace it with anything, right? But we're going to keep going. Now we're going to go to the second one, 20, remove that from our queue and replace it with its children. What are its children? We have 15 and 17. So let's add 15. I ran out of space, but that's okay. And 17 to our queue. Now this portion is the next level. It's level three. So let's continue to go. So 15 is the first one. Let's pop it. Let's get rid of it. Replace it with its children. It doesn't have any children. So it's a base case. Next one, seven. Okay. I wrote 17, but it's actually seven. Sorry about that. I'm not paying attention, but okay. We're going to get rid of this seven and we're going to see, okay, seven did not have any children either. So now when we, when we continue to go, we're going to see, okay, there's nothing left in our queue. So we have to stop, right? That's how we know we're done traversing the entire tree. When we went through every single node, what's the max level that we actually got to? Of course it was three. So that's what we're going to end up returning. The max depth of this, this tree was three. Okay, so now let's get rid of this and actually do that solution. So uh, well, another base case or the same base case, I'm just going to say is if not root, we can still return zero. So if there, there's no root, then we're going to return zero. And we're also going to maintain the current level that we're at. And we're going to have a queue, which in this case is going to be a deck. And initially, we're going to initialize this queue with just a single value, the root. I think most libraries do have a queue structure. So we're going to initialize our queue like that. We're going to have our level initially at one. We're going to keep going until the queue is empty, right? And if, so now we want to go through the queue and remove every element that's currently in it, right? So however many are in it. So we're going to say for I in range length of the queue at this current time, right? So we're going to take a snapshot of the length of the queue. Maybe it has one element. Maybe it has two. We're going to take a snapshot, remove all of those, and then add the children. So basically traverse the entire level and then add the next level and then once we're done with that entire loop we're going to increase the number of levels so for every node in the queue we're going to go ahead and pop from the left just like we did in the picture we're always going to be popping from the left of the queue and we're always going to be adding to the right of the queue so we're going to pop a node and then we're going to go ahead and add its children to the queue only if the children are not null so if node.left is non-null then we're going to go ahead and say queue.append node.left if node.write is non-null, then we're going to append that one as well. So q.append node.write. 
And actually, if we're going to be doing it this way, we should probably initialize our level to zero. So you can see that we're never going to be adding null nodes to our, our queue. So every time our queue is non-empty, we can be sure that there's at least a non-empty node in the queue, right? So we're basically counting the number of times our queue is not is going to be non-empty. So each time it is, we can basically increment the number of levels. And then at the end, once our queue is finally empty, we know that we have totaled up the number of levels and we can go ahead and return that. So you can see this solution also works and it's also pretty efficient. So this is the breadth first search solution. But there's one more solution I want to show you, the iterative depth first search solution. Basically depth first search without using recursion. So now we're going to do iterative depth first search and we're going to be needing a stack data structure because we're basically going to be emulating the call stack, the recursive call stack, right? So, you know, in a recursive DFS, we go to this node, right? And then we go to the left subtree, right? And when we're done with the left subtree, then we pop back up to the three and then we go down to, you know, the right subtree, etc. Right, that's like an in-order DFS, but we're gonna be implementing pre-order DFS with a stack because pre-order is actually by far the easiest one to do iteratively. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, come to this node, process this node, right? Then add the children to the stack, the left and right children, right? Now in now our normal pre-order traversal, we'll do the left subtree first. So what we're gonna do is now say, okay, let's do the left subtree. Well, well, we're gonna go to the left subtree, it's pre-order, so we're gonna process this, then we're gonna do its children. Children. Well, it doesn't have any children, right? So now what are we going to do? Well, this one was added to the stack. So then we can go ahead and process this one and add its children to the stack. And then we're going to process this one. It doesn't have any children. And then this one's going to be at the top of the stack because we just popped this one. And then we can process this one and then we're done, right? So we're going to do that. And as we do it, iteratively we're not just going to be adding the nodes themselves to the stack but we're also for each node going to be adding to the depth of each node because we can easily do that right we know this is going to be depth one when we add the left and right children we're going to say okay these are at depth two when we add these two we're going to say these are at depth three so we're just going to try to visit every single node find the node that had the greatest depth and then we can return that so initially we're going to start with node three at depth one in our stack. So now we're gonna pop from our stack. So let's pop this node and we process it. So, so far the max depth we found was one and let's add its children to the stack. So let's add 20 to the stack and let's add nine to the stack. And each of these are gonna have a depth of two. So now this is technically the top of the stack even though it's the bottom. So let's pop from the top of the stack pop this one, that's node nine. So now we found a max depth of two, that's better than one. And now let's also add the children of this. Of course, it doesn't have any children, so we're done with these. So now what's at the top of our stack that's, that's well, we popped this one, we popped this, this is at the top of the stack now, so let's pop this one, we pop 20. It also has a max depth of two, so we don't update the result, but now we can add its children to the stack. Uh, and the depth, of course, is going to be plus one. So both of these are going to have a depth of, of three. We're going to add seven and 15 to the stack. So now let's pop the top of the stack, 15, pop this. Uh, it has a max depth of three. So we've updated the result. Pop one more time. This also had a max depth of three. So we're done with that. We processed this node. And neither of these had any children. So now we're done with the DFS. So that's basically how it's going to work. It's pretty straightforward, at least if you're doing it with pre-order DFS with a stack. Okay, so finally for the last solution, so this was BFS, but now we're gonna be doing iterative DFS. We're gonna leave this initial case. If the root is null, we're gonna return zero. And our stack otherwise is just gonna have one single value on it, the root. But remember, we're also maintaining the depth. So we're gonna add a pair of values. We're gonna add the root, which is the node. And we're gonna add, it has a depth of one. And now we're gonna continue to go while our stack is non-empty. So this is pretty similar to BFS but we don't actually need nested loops. So now we're gonna pop from the stack, stack.pop. We're popping two values, remember, we're getting the node and we're getting its depth. And so what we're gonna say now is we're gonna say, if the node is non-null, you'll, you'll see why I'm gonna do this in a moment, because it's possible the node could be null. So if it's non-null, what we're gonna do is we wanna update our result. Now initially we're gonna set our result equal to one because we know we do have at least a one and so if we pop this node and it's non-null then we can potentially update our result so we'll set the result equal to the max of itself and the depth of the node that we just popped and then what we're going to do is to our stack we're going to add the children of 
of uh, this node and we're gonna add both of them together. So node.left, node.right, but we're not even checking. It could be possible that these children are null. So we technically might add null nodes to our stack, which is different than the drawing I showed, but we're, sh we're showing that if we do add a null node, we're gonna pop from, we're gonna pop it from the stack, but we're not actually gonna do anything with it, right? This if statement will prevent us from actually using that null node. So we're just gonna ignore the null nodes. And actually we're we're adding both of these nodes, but we also want to add the depth of each of them. So that's what I'm going to modify right now. So we're going to append the left node and we're going to append it with its depth, which is just going to be the depth of the node that we just popped plus one. And we're going to do the exact same thing for node dot right. So copy paste and update this. So we're adding both of the nodes, even if they're null, we're adding them. And then we're just going to continue through the stack until the stack becomes empty. And then once that is done, we can go ahead and return the result. And this is the entire code. And I actually just realized that we can actually simplify the code a little bit. We can actually get rid of these two first lines and set the result initially equal to zero. So then if we do have a null root node, the loop will execute, will pop this, but then the if statement won't execute. So then the result will stay zero and then we'll end up returning zero. But of course, if the root is non-null, we will end up updating the result. So this is the third and final solution that I wanted to show you. They all have basically the same time and space complexity but there's definitely variations with each of these solutions. So I hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It supports the channel a lot, and I'll hopefully see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.